Hi students, welcome to HSC Chemistry and the Organic Chemistry module. This is video number 28. And we're going to be looking at saponification. Now this is a real tricky one, this one, because all it asks us to do is to investigate the structure and action of soaps and detergents. Now that's a very small sentence with a huge amount of potential uh, depth in this. So what I'm going to do is give you uh, a couple of bits and pieces that kind of link into this. I really strongly suggest for these sorts of things that a table is a great way of setting these things up. Um, there are three different types of detergents. If you were to try and, and set your table up to simply look at soap and detergent, you would end up with a uh, quite a range of different things in your detergent. So you, you can do it this way, but you probably need to be aware of the fact that there are actually three types of detergents when you get to it. So what we want to do is we want to have a look at the structure and also the action of soaps and detergents. So that's all we have to do. But simply to put it like that, I guess, is a good way of uh, you summarizing your notes and making sure you've got everything. But there's an awful lot in this one. So uh, we might even, this could be a long video. We might even split this one up into a couple of sections just so you can uh, dip in and dip out. But uh, let's have a look at soaps and detergents. Okay, so if we're going to study soaps and detergents, the first thing we need to do is have a look at the saponification reaction. This is an organic process, and these are organic molecules. So we need to be aware of the fact that, um, that this is what's going to be happening here, and then look at some of the variations that are uh, a part of this process. So firstly, the, the saponification reaction is basically a reaction where we uh, mix an ester which could also be in the form of a fat or an oil um, with a basic solution. So something like sodium or potassium hydroxide. As these solutions are going to dissociate, as the ions are going to separate from one another, we have the sodium ions in the solution and the hydroxide ions in the solution. What is going to happen is we're actually going to get a breakdown of the ester bond. So in the example that I put in here, methyl octadecanoate, what we've got is an, uh, an ester bond that is formed. So you may remember from one of the previous videos, an ester bond is uh, some R group attached to a carbon, which is attached through a double bond to an oxygen. Then another oxygen, which would be where our acid group has originally come from. But then we would have had an alcohol group as well. So if I leave this where it is at the moment, you will see that on this side, on the right hand side, I have my methyl group. And then the R group along here would be another 17 carbons in length to form my octadecanoate. So a very long chain um, molecule, organic molecule, which includes this kind of uh, ester type bond here. Now the only difference between something like an ester and a fat and an oil is that usually the fats and oils are based on glycerol. So there's actually a three carbon chain um, and then the uh, fatty acid groups are all linked off the end of this chain. And what you find is that from our, our groups we actually have our, um, uh, our ester bond which is actually in three places effectively. So three places where the um, basic solution can actually attack our fat or our oil. And usually the difference between the fats and the oils is the uh, number of or, or the presence of double bonds. And of course we know that double bonds make something unsaturated whereas all single bonds made it, make it saturated. So we often talk about saturated fats, which usually are animal fats, and they have lots and lots of single bonds. And um, unsaturated or even polyunsaturated fats, which are more of your plant oils and things like that. Either way, what we want to do is to break the bonds that occur where the esters are to produce effectively um, a glycerol, which is basically a, an alcohol, which is a, a one, two, three propentriol. So 
Um, so you've got these three alcohol groups here, and then you have these fatty acids. And the thing with the fatty acids is on one end of them, the end that's basically separated out is where the, um, what's effectively the anion of the acid occurs. Now that would be attracted to the um, cation, which is in this case sodium, but that long chain molecule that has a, a um, the acid group at one end without the hydrogen, which is obviously then makes it a negative charge, and this long chain of basically carbons going on and on and on and on, whether or not they're double bonds doesn't really matter, um, because this is a non-polar region. And that's what's really important. So we have a polar head. Uh, we often refer to this as the head of the molecule and a non-polar region, which is the tail of the molecule. This is what is critical in terms of the action of soaps. Soaps are these um, cation versions of a um, fatty acid, so a sodium octadecanoate. I've misspelled that, octadecan oate, um, in order to give you this long chain molecule which has both a polar region and a non-polar region. And that's what's going to be really critical when we look at the action of our soaps. So we also need to talk about the structure of the soap. So let's look at it in a little bit more detail. So here you can see this very long carbon chain. You can see this would be a saturated um, fatty acid, because you can see they're all single bonds all the way along here. And then you can see we've got our carbon here, right here is our carbon, double bonded to an oxygen and to an O minus. And then the sodium obviously at the front there will be attracted just through electrostatic uh, attraction. So this is our long chain molecule. And one of the important things that we need our soaps or our detergents to do is to act as a bridge. The most important thing, or the most important reason that we use soaps or detergents is because what we're trying to do is we're trying to get something that is immiscible in water, such as dirt, mud, um, oils, some other types of grease which you might get on your clothing, to dissolving water. Now they won't be miscible with water, but what the detergent or the soap will do is it'll act as a bridge. It'll have one region which is polar and we know like dissolves like, so the polar region will be attracted to the water, but the non-polar region of this molecule will also attract um, things like greases, oils, uh, anything that is a non-polar molecule which would not um, combine with water, but the soap allows it to do so. So here we have a nice long chain structure. You can see that there's an anionic head, which is what attracts the sodium, uh, which is a cation, and we have this long non-polar tail. So as you analyze the structure of the soap, this is what you're looking at. And in fact, exactly the same sort of thing occurs with our detergents. The only difference with our detergents is they're not all um, anionic heads. There's actually three options for our detergents. For the soaps though, very simple. Um, the hydrophobic region, if you have a phobia, you have a fear. So this is the fear of water. So this is the non-polar region which will not um, attract water, but the other end is the hydrophilic, the love of water, and because it has a charge, it will attract the polar molecules and therefore it will link to the water. And that's why we talk about soaps forming a bridge between our polar and our non-polar solvents or um, components of solution. To understand the cleaning action, we need to look at this in a little bit more detail. Now, I am not expecting that you will have to understand the very complex chemistry associated with the heads of different types of soaps or detergents, because there's just simply not enough time for us to go into that in detail. But I think what you could be asked is to understand the difference between this polar head, this um, region of the molecule that will attract water, and the non-polar tail, which is the region that will repel water. So the tails here repel water, but they will attract non-polar substances. 
So this is how they form this bridge. Um, the other thing that I think is probably useful to throw in here is this term surfactant, which is a contraction of the uh, phrase surface acting agent. And if you haven't seen the effect of uh, putting a couple of drops of food coloring in milk and then adding a little detergent, you definitely want to do that because that detergent changes the surface tension. And it's that change in surface tension, which is what's actually happening here at the interface between these two that actually allows the miscibility um, to occur. It actually means we form something which is called an emulsion. As we overcome the, the forces that are acting at the interface between these substances, we're actually able to form little um, regions of, say, oil in water or water in oil. We can have either types of emulsions and our surfactants acting as bridges between the polar and the nonpolar regions. To look at the specific action, we need to understand this idea of micelles. And of course, you can buy micellar water, which is doing exactly the same thing. It's allowing you to remove something like makeup, which is not necessarily water soluble, um, using water. So you need a substance that's going to allow you to bridge between the water and the nonpolar um, makeup or, or uh, whatever it is that you're trying to remove. So <clears throat> what we then need to do is we need to see how this happens. So obviously the first thing that's going to happen is that the tails here, so these are the um, hydrophobic tails. And of course, they're going to be attracted to, say, a, a, a nonpolar molecule. Now, that might be um, a, a little blob of grease, for example, that we want to remove. So the tails will be in there, but the heads will be sticking out attracted to the water. So what, the, what will happen is effectively the water will um, attract those hydrophilic heads and they'll start to lift. And as they lift, more of these molecules can come in. And so instead of having a surface where basically we had, say, a little drop of oil sitting on a piece of cloth, for example, maybe my shirt. Um, so what we want is we want the um, detergent molecules to come in to start to lift this um, little uh, piece of oil away, this little droplet of oil away from the fabric that's sitting underneath it so that eventually all of these will surround it. Now, obviously, the tails will also attract one another because they're nonpolar regions and they'll attract other nonpolar regions through dispersion forces. But the hydrophilic heads will also be attracted to water molecules, um, depending on, of course, whether they have a positive or a negative charge, will depend on whether they're attracting the, uh, if you think of the water molecule as being a bent molecule with a negative region and a positive region, then we get this polarity occurring. And as a result of that, we're going to find um, attraction between uh, negatively charged heads and the positive region of the water molecules and vice versa. Once we've got uh, enough detergent molecules or soap molecules to completely surround one of these organic molecules, it will remove it and it will stay as a little droplet within the solution. And, and when we have a whole lot of these together, we form what we call an emulsion. Now, there's a lot of very common emulsions. Milk itself forms an emulsion. Um, a lot of uh, um, dressings form emulsions, like um, French dressings or mayonnaise, things like that. Depending on whether or not we're looking at a basically water-based substance with oils mixed through it, or more of an oily substance with water mixed through it. And often the water will carry things like salt um, dissolved within the water, which of course is going to add to the flavors. A very quick word on detergents because we've already had a reasonable amount of time already on this video and we don't want it to go on forever, but we do want to look at the fact that there are three types of detergents and the structure is very similar to that of a soap with some minor differences. So the first thing to remember is our soap has a hydrophobic tail, so it's basically the same, but it has an anionic head. It has a negatively charged head, and that comes from the carbon double bonded to the oxygen um, and then single bonded to the oxygen that was originally attached to the other part of that ester bond or to that glycerol uh, molecule. So it's got a negative charge, and that's our soap head, if you like, our hydrophilic region. 
Detergents come in one of three types. We call them cationic, which is when the head is actually positively charged. Anionic, when the head is um, negatively charged, similar to a soap. And um, non-ionic, when we have a polar region there. So there's still polarity, so there's still attraction with water molecules, like dissolving like, so we have polar. Um, that can be something just like an ethoxy group, so a carbon bonded to an oxygen or bonded to an oxygen, which is also bonded to a hydrogen. So you get polarity, that's going to interact with water molecules. An ammonium kind of group can give you a cation, uh, a sulfonate group, which is often attached to a, a complex benzene ring, and that's why I've gone into this in detail, um, but also uh, like a sulfate group, so we know this particular group has a negative charge, and so a variation on this is what we can often see um, at the head of some of our detergents. The fact that we they come in three different types means that there's actually some slight differences in terms of how they behave in um, hard water, for example, how the degree to which they foam and um, produce suds, and of course that sometimes we do want lots of sudsing, sometimes we don't want lots of sudsing, and this is going to depend on whether your detergent is used to clean your hair, clean your body, clean your clothes, clean your dishes. All of these are different types of detergents, they all have different properties. A lot of different additives were added to um, detergents as well, particularly phosphates, and we realized that that was actually as they got washed down the sink, creating some problems in the environment. So um, we don't have time to explore these. I really don't think we have time to explore any of these in a lot of detail. But I hope what you'll do is take some of the material from this video, go back to that table at the beginning, um, split it into soaps, detergents, structure and action, and have a look at exactly how these different substances are able to create bridges between polar and non-polar substances. And also just to see exactly how the micelles form. If you've got an understanding of those things, then I think you're going to be pretty well covered for this section. Thanks for watching.